All right. Today I have a very special guest. I have David Nagel on the podcast. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. And I, uh, I'm so happy that you're here. I've known about you um, at least for a couple of years, but I've known you personally. Uh, we were introduced through mutual friends, uh, Chris and Jen, uh, Chris Winfield and, and Jen Gottlieb introduced us. And you've been, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to know you over the last, call it six or seven months or so now. And I've always known you as a mindset coach. You know, you have, you know, the classic you know, rags to riches story, which I definitely want to talk about today. But what I didn't know about you, uh, which I found out in, in my preparation for today's podcast, is that you were pulled through a dam and lived to, to tell the tale about it. So yeah. I thought, uh, which, is, which is interesting because if, if that happened to me, that would be how I would open every conversation. I'd be like, hello, my name is Stephanie. I survived a dam. Nice to meet you. And like, <laughs> like never mentioned it before. So I, I think it's a really interesting way to start the conversation off because I think that this was very obviously a very trend, you know, a pivotal moment, uh, pivotal, pivotal moment for you. So um, walk us through what happened that day um, and what you learned from it. Well, it, I think it's, so that happened in September of 1989. And in June, the, the, the June just prior to that, my son was born. So he was very colicky. Uh, my wife and I were both working and I was, we were, we were exhausted. That's, mm -hmm. Frankly, that's what it was. He was sleeping like an hour a day. So we were just completely wiped out. Uh, we have a daughter that is a year and a half older than him. So um, come September, my mother was starting to sense that we were, we were kind of coming apart a little bit. And she said, we're going out on your uncle's boat this weekend. Why don't you see if you can get your sister-in-law to watch the kids and just get out of the house for a day? You know, just let's have a day and relax. You can kind of get yourself back together. And I mean, that sounded like heaven to us at that moment. Right. Yeah. We really needed a break, you know? So uh, we went out, we went to uh, the Illinois river in Marseilles, Illinois, and I had never been there before. Uh, I had never been on my uncle's boat either. So it really wasn't, really wasn't a ski boat. It was a bigger boat, um, but you could ski off of it. So anyway, we go out there and we get on the boat and there's, it, it's me, my, uh, my now ex-wife, um, my aunt, my uncle, my mother, and my stepfather were on that boat. And we take this ride up the river about an hour. And I'm not really paying attention to where we are, or what's going on. We're just all talking and everybody's having a good time and they're, they're asking about the, the new baby and we're kind of explaining all that. So we're just going up this river. And then my uncle says to me at some point, he said, so do you want to ski? And I'm like, yeah, definitely want to ski. Let's do this. So I jumped in the water. He threw me the skis and I was actually having some trouble getting this ski on my foot. Um, I don't know if it was a new ski or it didn't fit right or whatever, but it wasn't mine. So I was having a little trouble getting it on. and while I'm trying to get it on and get the rope and get situated, we're the, the boat is not like moving forward. We're just sitting in the water and we're actually going with the current. Um, but because they're watching me and I'm watching them, nobody's really watching what's happening on the sides of us, like the shore or anything. Like relative to the shore. Rel yeah. Exactly. Relative yeah. to the shore. We don't realize how fast we're moving. And unbeknownst to me at the time, and I, I don't think my uncle knew this either, the week before it had rained, like it had rained the entire week. So the river was high, but it was real wide. So it didn't seem like it was rough, but the current was moving rather rapidly. Strong, yeah. And then I had this like intuitive moment in the water where I, for whatever reason, I looked over my left shoulder and I saw this huge sign on shore. It said danger, stay clear. I think it was 600 feet. And just beyond that was the dam. Now, I, in, in that moment, I, all I did was turn around and I said, uh, I think we better get out of here. We're getting, we're getting close to this dam. I think we better move up the river a little bit. So he threw me the rope. And by the time I grabbed the rope, we had broken the 300 foot barrier. And I'm like, we better get out now. And he just floored the boat and ripped the rope right out of my hands. Oh, so man. there was no, I didn't even have a chance to get back on the boat. So I turn around. And I see myself headed towards this dam. At no point did I think I was going to get sucked into it or under it or anything like that. 
I was thinking, I don't want to get, I don't want to hit my head on this huge concrete wall, right? So I put my feet out in front of me. And as I put my feet out in front of me, I was like almost right up to the dam and it just sucked me under. And I didn't have a chance to get a, a breath full of air, a lung full of air or anything. It just pulled me right, right under. And honest to God, the, the only thing that went through my mind at that moment was I went, oh shit. And I thought it was dead. I mean, I literally thought this is it. It was over. I tried to struggle like to swim to the top, but it just pulled me right in. I could feel myself being pulled in and then everything became completely peaceful. I, I mean, I've talked to hundreds of people that have had near death experiences since then. And they've all said the exact same thing right at the moment where they thought they were going to die or they did. And then they were end up like they were brought back. They had a heart attack or something. Mm -hmm. It was completely peaceful. Like this unbelievable peace, Stephanie. It was, it was amazing how peaceful it was. And then I felt myself rising. So what had happened was I went through the dam, these gates lift up, it went through the dam, down this cement wall on the other side, I got knocked around on the boulders down there, never felt anything. And I feel myself rising. Well, it, it, I thought in my head, either I'm going to heaven or I'm going to break the surface <laughs> yeah, of the water. This is the ascension I, part of going to heaven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this <laughs> right. is the ascension part, like crazy stuff going through your head. Yeah. And I did, I shot out of the water just before I was ready to black out. And I got one big gasp of air and then it pulled me back in again and tumbled me around some more. And then I came out a little further down when I broke away from the boil on the other side of the, the dam. Mm -hmm. So my first thought, I'm like I'm breathing like, you know, gasping for air because I'm so oxygen depleted. And I'm, my instinct was just to get to shore. So I'm trying to swim and... I'm not making any progress at all. And as I pulled my hands out of the water, I had skinned my hands. They were just bloody. They were just, all the skin was just peeled all down my palms. So I must have slid down the wall like this or something on the opposite mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And I realized I wasn't going to get to shore. So what I did know because of the way that we came up to that, uh, to where we, we got in the boat, was that two miles down the river from this town was another town called Ottawa. And there was a dam there. Now the Illinois River travels uh, west at this point and it, it dumps into the Mississippi River. So it actually steps down very rapidly over like a hundred miles till it gets to the, the Mississippi. So there's several dams, locks and dams in between there. Mm. And I was, I was going down the river and I didn't want to, it was like, I can't go through another one. I just made it through one. So there was a, a an island in the center of the river. Which I just have to, I just have to stop you for a minute. The odds of survival of going through one dam. I, I can't, I don't even know what that, well, what I'll that percent. I'll tell you in a minute when, okay. when I get that part of the, but you're right. It's astronomical. Like oh. it's, it's, I was one of two people only that ever lived going through. Oh my God. Everybody else that went through died and they would have people go through it every single year. It was crazy when I found out afterwards what, what they knew and what they did nothing about and right. how many people were actually killed. It was, it was nuts. Okay. So I go around this, I go around this Island. There's this long branch sticking out in the, out from this tree into the water. And I managed to grab onto it. I just was able to grab onto it. I pulled myself up to the branch and I remembered at that moment, when I went, when I was in the army for a year, and when I went through basic training, they take you through a survival course where they tell you, it doesn't matter how bad you're injured, what really matters is if you panic or not. And if you cannot panic, if you can really keep your head about you, like your guts could be spilling out from you. If you could push them back in and keep your head about you, you have a, a very good chance of surviving most things. So I thought, okay, I have to, I can't, I can't panic. I literally felt like I was going to go into shock. I was losing it. And I'm like, I can't panic. I can't panic. And just as I did that, my son's face flashed on the screen of my mind, like cl as clear as I'm seeing you right now. Mm -hmm. That gave me this like internal strength to hold on even more. So I started thinking. With skinned hands. With skinned hands. Well, and when I pulled my arms out, I still, to this day, I can show you sometime, I have all these scars from these puncture wounds on my arm. I don't know what the hell I hit branches or something, but I had these deep puncture wounds all over my arms. 
I started to unbuckle my life vest and push the branch onto the inside and then buckle around it because I didn't know how long I could hang on to this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started praying. I was like, you know, God, please don't let me die today. Please don't let me die today. And in that moment, for whatever reason, the thought that went through my mind was I was in this place. My life was really bad at that point because I couldn't get myself to do the things that I was supposedly told to do all my life, like finish high school, go to college, don't get in trouble, like all this stuff. I don't know why that was going through my head, but it was with the idea that if I died, I left my wife and kids with nothing but problems. And I was basically asking God for a second chance. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I promise if, if you let me live today, that I will figure out why I couldn't do those things. I will fix my life and then I'll spend the rest of my life teaching other people how to do it. Stephanie, I don't know where that came from or why I was thinking that when I was on that branch, but it must have been the thing in life that I was resisting the most. And then when everything got stripped away, that's all that was there was that basic truth. Mm -hmm. So just as I, I have this conversation with God, I hear a guy say, I found him. And there's this man, now this is the weirdest part, and I don't always incorporate this part into the story because it kind of, it's a little difficult to explain and I don't know how people actually take it. There's this guy that shows up on this island and he's got a walkie-talkie. And he's talking to the Ottawa River Rescue, which is a couple of guys from the fire department in boats and, and they're the ones that get people out of trouble when they're in trouble on the river. So he says, you stay there. He said, do not try to swim to this island. You'll never make it. The current is too strong. Just hang on. They're coming. I don't know how long that period of time was, but it seemed like 10, 15 minutes maybe that I was hanging on there. He stood there the whole time. He didn't say much to me other than that. He was directing the boat to wherever I was. Boat shows up, gets me in, never see this guy again. Asked who he was, nobody knew. Um, he wasn't from the fire department. No, nobody knew why he was there. Uh, I went back to that town after I healed because I wanted to say thank you to everybody that, that rescued me. Mm-hmm. And no, to this day, nobody knows who the guy was, where he came from. He was there and then he was gone. It was, wow. it was the oddest, it was the oddest thing. So he wasn't t- part, he wasn't part of the, fi- you said he was not part of not the fire part department. Of fire department. No, he was mm-hmm. not. So why there was a guy on this island, and it was an island in the middle of the river, with a walkie-talkie is beyond me. But anyway, the guy was was there. Mm -hmm. So it could have been that he was a fisherman and had a boat, and he heard the distress signal go off on on whatever channel that they used that somebody went through the dam, and he was looking. I I really don't know. But it's just, it's a... It's a weird thing that kind of haunts me a little bit. Like, who was this guy? Where did he come from? How did he know that I was there? that type of thing. So they take me to shore and I get out of the boat and I'm walking just fine. Like I'm really not in any pain at this point because I've got so much adrenaline going through. That's right. Yeah. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm look, there's all these people in an ambulance and I'm looking for somebody I recognize. I'm looking for family members. I'm looking for my wife. I don't see anybody. And they're saying, you need to get in the ambulance. And I'm like, I don't want to get in the ambulance. I'm fine. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And this little guy, real little guy comes up to me, older man. And he said, mister, your ass is going to really hurt in the morning. Mm -hmm. He said, you better get in the, in the ambulance. And I turned around and I looked and the whole, I had like cut off jeans I was wearing back then. And like the whole right side was ripped off and it looked like somebody had beat me with a baseball bat. Like my rear end and my lower back were swollen and bruised. And it was, it was Mm -hmm. pretty bad. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm really hurt here. I better get in the ambulance. So the ambulance. You were walking. You were ambulatory. I was walking. Yeah, yeah. I was walking. I walked. I got out of the boat and I was walking around through wherever it was that they pulled me out of the water. Mm-hmm. So they get me in the ambulance. They take me to the emergency room. They do whatever they're whatever they're doing. My uh, my wife shows up. My mother shows up. My stepdad show up there. Um, they were a wreck because they had them. The Army Corps of Engineers ran that dam at the time. And they were telling them that I was dead. Then they're like, nobody goes through this and, and survives. Basically, right now, it's just recovery to find his body and uh, to pull him out. 
So they, they, for a good hour, they thought I was, I was gone is what they, what they told me. Um, so they examined me. They said that I had, uh, I had broke part of my spine in my lower back. Um, I had a bunch of discs that were now ruptured or bulging or whatever it was. But I, basically I went home and it was, it was recovery until I could go back to work. There was no surgery, surgery or anything that they, that they recommended. They were like, just heal the best that you can and then we'll examine you afterwards. So that's, that's another story, but it's not, it's, it's not really all that relevant yet. So, but when I'm in the hospital, they, I, the amount of people that they sent was really weird. So they had the Army Corps of Engineers come see me. They had the state police come see me. They had the park ranger service come see me. They had these two different rescue departments, one from Ottawa and one from Marseilles. And they're all asking me the same thing. How did you survive going through that? Mm -hmm. And I'm laying there and I have no idea. I'm like, I have no idea how I survived. Like I didn't do anything. You know, I think I said, I think it was just the life fest. And they're like, no, you don't understand. We have people go through this every year and they die. And they tell me this story about two guys that were on a fishing boat, just a little motor boat. They were fishing on the river the year before. The motor went out on their boat. They got sucked into the dam. The boat got sucked into the dam and they got stuck in inside the dam somewhere. So they send three firefighters down with scuba gear to get them out. All five of them died. So now all they do is open up the gates all the way and they let the body kind of flush out. My like in luck, if you want to talk about luck, was that because it had rained the week before, the, the dam was wide open. So the gate wasn't half closed. Had it been half closed, the water in, is going like this. I More mean, turbulent. Yeah, yeah. So it spit me right out instead of me, you know, being tumbled around like you were in a dryer or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I asked them, I said, you know, it seems to me like if you ran a cable with buoys across the river where that sign is, that people could grab onto it or they could anchor themselves to it if they were in a boat that broke down. And they were like, yeah, well, we thought about that, but we, we were concerned that it would get too much debris caught on it. And I'm like, yeah, well, you, you tell me people go through this thing every year and they die. And they're like, yeah, every year we have a number of people that go through it and they get, and they get killed. And then they showed me a picture of a tugboat, okay, that, that lost its engines in 1940 got pinned up against the dam, it flipped it over and just crushed it into pieces and pulled it through. And when I do live events, I show the picture of this tugboat. The thing is, it's a full-size tugboat. The thing is mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, that was, the, that was the scenario that really started me thinking different. I started questioning things because at that point in time, I realized, I mean, I was, I was 23. Yeah, I was 23 years old when that happened, um, 23, 24. And I'm th I realized at that moment that life's short. You know, you could be here one day and gone the next, and that's for real. And, you know, when you're in your early 20s, you don't really think – I mean, you know people die. You've been to funerals. You've lived a No, but you think you're immortal. When you're – you do – like, yeah, when you're 20, when I think about the things I did in my 20s, I would just never even think right? about them now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was a wake-up call. And I thought, you know, I don't like the direction my life is going in. I have to change. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know what, I didn't know what to change. And I was actually a little bit under this belief that, okay, why didn't I die? Why was I only, oh, and the guy before me that lived, he was a, like a quadriplegic after he went through there. That's how bad. Oh my God. Was. Yeah. So I'm like, why didn't any of this happen to me? There must be a reason for me being alive. And I kind of thought, well, maybe God is going to show me now what it is that I'm supposed to do because I felt very lost. I didn't understand why I was really in the situations that I was in other than I knew that I didn't finish like high school and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then nothing changed. So before I knew it, I was back working for the company I was working before. I was uh, working. This is while you were a forklift. You were working as a forklifter. Yeah. At this point? yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Driving forklift. Mm -hmm. um, nothing, nothing was changing. Matter of fact, it was actually getting worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, you know, then I had this, I had this, this incident where I was working, uh, driving the forklift 
And I had been rap reprimanded twice in one day. Um, I was sick. I had like the flu or something. I was exhausted. I was freezing cold. It was February in Chicago. And I just had a meltdown in the back of this trailer one night, was just sobbing. And I, and I was asking God, like, what is it? Just show me something. I have no idea what to do. Because I was trying to figure out, okay, if I'm going to get out of this situation, I've got to do something, right? Mm. That, that I knew, but I couldn't, I didn't have time or money to go back to school. I had two kids. Um, I was working six and a half days a week. I was basically working two jobs. And there was no internet then. I mean, it, you couldn't take a class online or anything. So I really had to go back to school and I didn't have the time or the money to do that. I didn't know how to get out of the situation. So when I have this meltdown in the back of this trailer, it, a voice said to me in my head, change your attitude. It was very clear. It was very distinct. It almost seemed like it was an out-of-body experience at the time. Um, but I thought to myself, that's interesting because I've been hearing that my whole life and I don't even know what it means. Right. So when I was a kid and I, I was very bored in school, didn't, I didn't like to study. It just, it didn't resonate with me at all. So the teachers would tell my dad, you know, David's a pretty bright guy. If he would just change his attitude and apply himself, he would get really good grades. Um, so I would go home and my dad would say, change your attitude. And then I would get grounded from one report card to another. And, and basically I had all my privileges taken away. I would have to stay in my room every day after school. And all I was supposed to do was study, but nobody even taught me how to study. Right. So it was just, that, that was their answer. Go to it's your like room. It's like when parents say focus, it's like, what, I don't, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yes. Focus? What do you yeah. mean study? What do you mean focus? Yeah. You yeah. need to focus. You need to try harder. Um, I was telling the story to uh, a group of people at, at my Art of Success Summit uh, last week, I was saying, you know, I would come out when I had to learn my multiplication tables. And if you remember the flashcards that they mm -hmm. used to use. Mm -hmm. So like my mom would do these flashcards and the second I got one wrong, she would say, you don't, you didn't study enough, go back and study. So and there was no, not even any focus on any of the wins at all. It was just, it's not enough, go back and study. You don't know it, whatever. And or how to reframe failure, right? So if you fail, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean for you? Where should you, yeah. Yeah, there was none of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none. So in that moment, when I heard this voice that said, change your attitude, uh, I needed a reference point. And I took the guy that owned the company that I worked for. And the reason that I picked him was because he had a story that I could resonate with. He started the company in his garage in a suburb of Chicago. He built it up out of that. So I had this like working class mindset, you know, do everything yourself type of a, of a childhood and that I could resonate with. So I thought, what's the difference between this man and myself? And the difference was he must have loved what he did because he built this huge, like he was the largest food importer in the country. At the, at the time. He built this huge company out of his garage. Um, so he must have loved it to some degree. I hated it. I knew that I hated it. He must have done a really good at it because here he is with this huge successful company. And I knew that I was not giving my best with the quality of work that I was doing. I didn't even know what my best was because nobody ever pushed me to the point of me seeing what my best was. And because I was so angry and entitled and victimized in my own head at that time, I really didn't treat people very well. So I thought, okay, this guy loves what he does. He does everything to best, his best of, of his ability, and he treats people with total respect. Those are the three things I'm going to change because that's what I could identify. And I'm going to do it for a year and see if that makes any difference in my life. At the whole, the whole time I'm having this conversation with myself, I've got the little devil David sitting on my shoulder going, oh, no, you're not. You've never stuck to anything in your life. What makes you think you're going to do this? And I'm like, damn it. No, I'm going to do this. I am really going to stick to this. In a, a month later, within a month, my income went from 20000 a year to 62000 a year. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa was right. Like, I didn't even know anybody personally that was making 62,000 a year then. And, and that was a lot more money, you know, in like 1990 than it is today also. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I and was, you attribute, and you attribute that to an attitude change. 
to treat yes. people nicely. Yes. Well, but the thing here was the thing. Everybody around me was saying, you got so lucky. Most people never get this lucky. You got really lucky with this opportunity that came into your life. Don't blow it, right? Um, but there was a part of me that going, this wasn't luck. This has something to do with that change that I made, but I just don't know how it has mm -hmm. something to do with it. Then when I started to study, because what that did was it was that preempted me into this idea of, okay, and now I really want to know what I changed. How did, how did this change take place? So I began a period of study for about seven years, but I didn't even know where to start. I didn't know that there was a self improvement section. I would just go to libraries and start checking out biographies and books. And one thing led me to another. And eventually I started coming across books that really started to make a difference. But one of the first books that I came across was Think and Grow Rich. And in the, in the introduction to the book, Napoleon Hill's got something he calls the sly disguises of opportunity. And he said, uh, when opportunity came, it usually comes in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. He said, this is why so many people miss opportunity. They see it as something that they don't understand or don't want. And I thought, that's what happened to me. This opportunity for me to triple my income was around me for two years and I couldn't see it because my attitude was so bad. And this I was the diesel. This was the guy who was driving the diesel truck. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Drew Batty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was, he was like, we had become friends over two years. He would come in every Tuesday and Thursday where I worked and he would fill our trucks. And I, I was so arrogant. I was so, um, I had such a bad attitude that I didn't see what he did as an opportunity. And when, he, he actually asked me, he's like, why don't you come to work for us? Get out of here and come to work with us. And I'm like, Drew, there's no way. And part of the biggest problem was I was afraid. I was afraid to drive a truck carrying fuel. I saw it as like a bomb on wheels. Right. And I asked him one day, I said, Drew, anybody ever die at your company driving one of these things? And he goes, yeah. He said, two years ago, there was a guy driving down I-65 in Indiana. He flipped a truck and he burned to death. And I'm like, see, yeah, see right there. Right. <laughs> like, Great sales pitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, that, I don't want anything to do with this. And then he said, I said, besides, how much could you make anyway? And he said, well, last year I made 50000 And I paused for a moment and I was like, you're full of shit. You didn't make no 50000 And he said, I'll bring my check stub next week. So I said, you do that. So he brought it. And sure enough, he had. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into it further and then I went to work for that company in the first year I made 62,000. So, um, it was, it was a huge, huge shift for me and it allowed me, it shifted my mind enough to say, there's something else going on here besides what, you know, you better understand this. And I thought, you know, if I understand this, there's no telling where I could go in life. So I started studying. That was, that was the start of it. And so you were reading Napoleon Hill. Were there other books that were very influential for you? Um, the, so the real, the real, the, the thing that led me on, on the self-development path the most was one night I came home, because I worked nights. I came home, it was probably three or four in the morning. I would get, my wife would make me dinner, be in the refrigerator on a plate. I would heat it up. And I would sit down and turn the television on for a little while. And I turned it on. And this was just when Tony Robbins started his oh, right. infomercials. Yeah. I Fran that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this and he's talking about all these different things. And I'm sitting there shaking my head going, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. That's me. And I think it was like $167 to buy personal power back then, like mm -hmm. three easy payments, you know? Yeah. So... I, the first night, I couldn't even get myself out of the chair to go buy the tapes. I was, I was like, I want to do it. I kept watching the infomercial over and over again, but I couldn't get out of the chair. The second night, I got myself out of the chair. I called when the operator answered. I hung up the phone. I was so scared to spend that hundred and sixty-seven bucks. I'm like, that's a lot of money. You it know, was. A, it that's was, a lot of money back then. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like this might be a con. It might be a scam. Is this really going to work? Like it was coming from all of that kind of mindset. Right. Third night I said to myself, okay, it's 167 bucks. If it doesn't work, it's not really a big deal. It's no loss. Just buy it and see what it is. So I bought it. And then 
you know, he led me, it was him that actually led me to think and grow rich. I had been introduced to it once before, but I didn't really do, I didn't really read it. Mm-hmm. But I, I heard about Earl Nightingale and uh, Jim Rohn and all these things. Like he mentioned them in the program at one point or another. And then I started researching who they were and picking up their, their information. And, and I started studying. And then that, would, that set me out on the course. Um, but I had a conflict. My conflict was I didn't understand how religion played into the role of success. I was raised Catholic and I had a lot of conflicting education when it came to success um, that I had no answers for. And I had also been exposed to several other denominations in the Christian religion and a few outside of it, just from different places that we lived when I was a kid. I got to meet other kids. I met, I had some Jewish friends and stuff. So I got to go explore what they were studying. I was real fascinated with it as a child. But basically, overall, every single one of them had this negative connotation when you talked about money or religion or sex. Like there was like a lot of negativity there. Uh, a lot shame. Of, a lot shame. of shame. Yeah. A lot of right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And something about me said there was something about all this stuff that we just didn't understand as people, right? So... Also, in my youth, I was, I was born in the mid-60s, so Martin Luther King, um, all the civil rights movement, Vietnam War, my father was in, is, was in Nam. Uh, there was a lot of change going on in society at that time, and it was televised. So there was a lot of conversation in the house at that time also. So... I was getting this double binding message. One message was you're, you're, we're all created by this loving God. And the other message was people are miserable and there's all these terrible things happening. Or so these are I, the bad people. These are the bad people. These are the good people. There is yeah, like a divide. Yes. Very much, very mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. And when I would ask, when I used to go to the catechism classes, I would ask the nuns or whoever was teaching us at the time, these questions, and they would never answer them. They would, I would actually get in trouble for asking these questions. Like, what is it that's so wrong with sex? What is it that's so wrong with money? Why is it bad to be this or do that or not do this or not do that? And they, they said that I was just starting trouble. And I usually would get sent in, I'd have to go sit in the corner or go sit in the hallway um, because they wouldn't answer the question. So I walked around with this question of, do we really have do we really come from a loving god or is it just something people don't understand about god's message message and, and I, I carried that with me through my my whole childhood so when i started listening to tony he did in those days he did not talk about spirituality at all it was just how to be successful how to set goals how to break through fear that type of stuff which i thought was cool but it wasn't answering these other questions and it wasn't until I was introduced to the, the man who became my mentor, who was Bob Proctor, mm-hmm. that he incorporated all the spirituality into it. And that was the exact answer I was looking for. Now, I understood how it happened basically from top to bottom. And it was, it, that's, that's really when I lit up uh, about learning this stuff. Because I, he, he put it together in a way where... It wasn't separate, it was incorporated, and here's how it's incorporated into the manifestation of your life or business or, or whatever it is that you want. And also, how do you get rid of the shame and the judgments around all of these ideas around money and sex and freedom and those types of things. So when I started learning that, uh, I became very, very passionate about the study, not ever considering that I might be going into that field as a career at some point, but just learning as much as I could. And, that, and that's really what I spent my time doing for, for a seven year period of time. It was studying and raising my family. I literally got rid of everything recreational in my own personal life because I wanted to learn as much as I could. And Stephanie, my life was getting better. I mean, it was, it was getting better and better and better and better. I started off at the petroleum company, just driving a truck. I was the first one that was hired on um, as a truck driver to be promoted into management with that company. And then a few years later, I was in charge of expanding that company across the country. So I had done really, really well there. I could have stayed there for the rest of my life. Um, But it also afforded me the ability to be able to go to all these seminars and get all these books and hire a coach and, you know, do all of those things. 
So let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that because you've spoken a lot about uh, you know on your podcast, the Successful Mind Podcast, which we'll link. We'll make sure that we link out into the show notes. You talked about how our behaviors are really driven by our beliefs and you know how we think about success. You sort of touched on it uh, around you know sex and money and you know the the shame and the guilt that sort of clouds that cloaks those things. Um, can you explain the concept of how you talk about core wounds and core fears and how they develop and where and why they develop? Yeah, absolutely. So I became really fascinated. The, the first fascination started around the idea of beliefs because I noticed something that was, that was incongruent in literature itself. And that was, if you go back and you read, say, the Christian Bible, uh, and there's other texts like the Bhagavad Gita and other texts that, that have this, do the same thing. The word belief carries a much different connotation 2,000 years ago than it does if you read literature, say, within the last hundred years. The way the word is even used is completely different. So basically, we walk around and we say, I believe this, I believe that. And really, what we're saying is I have an intellectual understanding around that idea or that concept, or maybe how that idea or concept is used or what its purpose is, that type of thing. If you read ancient text around that word, it literally incorporates a power that is available to us to be able to do anything. And they use just that word uh, to be able to, to communicate that idea in those texts. So for instance, in Mark, uh, in the Christian Bible, it says that, w- that if you believe something, you can, you can say to this mountain from here to there, it would be cast in the sea. There, there's nothing that is, is impossible to a person that, that believes that they can do something. So I started thinking to myself, what is the difference between this belief and the belief that we use today? And the biggest, the biggest way to explain it is this. If you have that kind of a belief, you have no doubt. There's no doubt in your mind, which is interesting because if that's the case, then it would, it would literally represent why we're able to create so many things in our life that we don't even realize that we're creating, but it's because we actually believe this is the way the world works, this is the way whatever it is that we're manifesting our life, our life itself, the environment of our life, the circumstances, the results, is, is equivalent to whatever our belief system is. But then it opened up the door to, well, what about, what about changing so that you can create the life that you want? How does that fall into play? And why is it there's so many people that are creating lives that they don't want? And then there was this one. Why does this not occur naturally in nature? Because in nature, everything follows its purpose. It doesn't struggle. It doesn't want for anything. Uh, it doesn't suffer from depression. It's consistently moving forward, and it doesn't question what it is or what its purpose is. It's and just it's productive. It's productive consistently. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought these are these are pretty interesting. These are pretty interesting questions and concepts to find the answers about. So it started with the idea that where does this where does this difference between human beings and nature occur where we get off purpose? Because I believe that everybody had a purpose, a specific purpose. Like we don't have this unbelievable intellect for nothing. And there's things that have less of an intellect than we do or no intellect and they don't, they don't have problems. So it has to, something has to be screwed up with the intellect somewhere. Well, when a baby is born, it absolutely needs its mother the most, but both parents in order to survive, which puts the baby in a very vulnerable position. So we're also linguistically challenged when we're born. We don't have the ability to talk. We don't have the ability to reason. We can't critically think about anything. We're operating basically on instinct, just as anything else in nature would. So we find a way to communicate with our mother to get our needs met. And the mother figures out a way to be able to understand what the baby's communicating. And as long as the parents present 
more of a stable atmosphere for that child, then the child will generally grow up and develop a stable, a, a, a stable intellect and a, a, a stable self, self image or, or, or self esteem. If there's anything going on in that life that isn't that way, that, that, that's not stable, that's erratic in any way, the message that is being sent to that child is that it may be or may be not safe, but the child does not consciously think about that idea. It just reacts to it. So what does the child do? If, if, the, mother, if the mother withdraws, neglects, abandons, disapproves, disapprove of in any way, the child is not feeling that love and harmony between itself and the mother which is going to cause that child to react in a way because it's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel good internally or emotionally for that little child. And I mean, after years of study, we know that if you take a baby and you don't, you put them in an incubator and you don't ever touch that baby, the baby will die. It, needs, it fails to thrive. Yeah. yeah, it fails to thrive. It needs, it needs physical touch. So there's definitely something there, but in that kind of communication that allows the baby to be able to grow and thrive and to move toward more life. So you have, so you have this, this idea about stability. Then you have the idea about what are the belief systems that the parents carry that are communicated to that child. So the child, up until the age of seven, has, doesn't have a conscious mind developed. Uh, conscious and reasoning start to develop around 17. And in males, at least, they go up to like the age of 25. So there's a whole process in time in which that is consistently developing. But prior to that, everything that's going on and around us is going into our subconscious mind and it becomes fixed. We don't have the ability to reject it. We don't have the ability to say, oh, I like this idea, but I don't like that one. So I'll keep this one. I won't keep that one. The child is just reacting to its environment. So it learns very quickly how to behave so that it gets its needs met from its mother. It also learns how not to behave to cause the mother to be angry, upset, uh, shaming, abandoning, you know, erratic in any way. It, it, we're we're pattern-recognizing uh, uh, beings. That's, that's what we do with our brain. We recognize these patterns and then we replicate those patterns in order for us to stay safe. The subconscious mind basically has two main functions, and that is to keep you alive. So if, you're, if there's any immediate danger in your life, it goes into fight or flight system. And then its other main function is reproduction. It doesn't really care about things that are gonna harm you or kill you 20 years from now. So it, it's not concerned with that. It's what, what is going on right now. So the pattern recognition of good behavior, solid behavior from the mother or poor behavior is picked up on really quick. And then the child begins to develop into different roles or different patterns of behavior that allow it to get its needs met. If the, if the mother is erratic in that behavior, it may take on very different roles for very, very different situations. So you end up with an adult where or you end up with a child where it'll, it'll behave one way if it's just the, the, the child and the mother. But because the child, because the mother acts differently when the father's around, let's say the father's an alcoholic, comes home drunk every day, and there's arguing, the child may learn to develop a, a different modality uh, where it can, it can prevent that arguing from happening in some way, just by some behavior that it learns to develop in order to stop that, it'll act totally different when mom and dad's together. It may act totally different when it's with the father or when it's with the, with the grandparents. So through all of this process, it's learning how to be with these people based on how they're behaving around the child. During that time, what the child is not learning is who that child really is and what that child's purpose is and what the potential of that child is, because everything is being directed by these parents. Now, one generation after another is passing down the idea that the primary function in our life that we need to be concerned with is, sa is safety. Like, we have to be safe. We learn that right from the, from the very beginning. And we're learning it from people 
that do not have the ability to create a life exactly the way that they want. I mean, we're free to a point where if, if intellectually we don't understand how to create the amount of resources that we, that we want and need whenever we want it, then we become reliant on other individuals for that. So we see that with people who work jobs all the time. They don't know how to create the amount of money that they want in their life, but they know how to go do a job and get paid a certain amount, and then they adjust their lifestyle based on how much money they're actually getting paid. So it's very interesting. We're, we're free, but we're also very, very dependent on other people. And the coping mechanism that we've learned from that is how do we stay in the good graces of another person so that they allow us to, to, to work in that job or be in that relationship or stay in school. And we learn it from, from little kids all the way up until we get employment somewhere. And then that's the behavior and the behavior is all based on how do I keep these people around me so that I stay safe and I can continue to live a semi-productive uh, life? And so that's, that's the core wound right there is that fear the of abandonment or that unworthiness or that fear around not being good enough, not being lovable. Not, that, and right. that comes from mom, like our mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers. Yes, because everybody else has the ability to take our worth away from us. We could be fired at any moment. We could be demoted at any moment. We could also be promoted. So all of the power to go up or down in our life is in somebody else's hands. And we're taught if we behave ourselves, if we do a good job, then we will get a reward. But the reward comes from another person. In other words, so, fall in line. Fall in line. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with our need for love. If we're a good person, if we're a nice person, then maybe somebody else will love us, right? So if you have two people that are, have not completely learned how to love themselves, let's say, and they come together, they'll be attracted to each other's uh, fulfillment of their own weakness. So mm -hmm. if you're a little bit stronger in one area and I'm a little bit stronger in another area, mm -hmm. that makes up for the two places that we're weak. And all of a sudden we think we're in love with each other, but it really has nothing to do with that. It is just supporting an area where we don't actually feel very safe in. And so, so where does that, how does that move into uh, our conscious mind? Because I, you know, we have these, or I guess, I guess uh, maybe before I even ask that, do you have a framework or a way to think about how to repro, is there a way to reprogram the subconscious or is it just becoming aware that these beliefs have been installed in us and changing, becoming more awake to the, the program that's constantly running in the background? Well, it's both. So prior to the age of seven, you get all this information that's put into your subconscious mind. Then at, after that point, the conscious mind, in the subconscious mind, the conscious mind starts to develop. The conscious mind is what's taking in all the information that's going on around us through our senses. So that information comes in, so like I got this coffee cup in front of me here, right? I know it's a coffee cup only because somebody told me it was a coffee cup. I didn't have to critically think about what this is. Mm -hmm. So when this, when this image comes into my conscious mind, my subconscious mind tells me how to think about this object because that's what somebody else told me. Right. So, and that's with everything in life. For seven years, we're told how to think about all the things that we're experiencing. And then as we experience them, we're not critically thinking, do I want to think this way about it? We're thinking, here's how you think about it. And then school reinforces it. If you start to get out of line, they, that we call that correction. We correct the person and say, no, you can't think about it this way. You have to think about it this way. And it goes all the way up through university. Like it, it's, it, it's, in, it's in everything. So if we want to change it, we have to first understand that our conscious mind is telling us how to think. And it may not be true. It may be reality, but that doesn't mean that it's true. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is true? True is that when we take everything about something and we give it consideration. So for instance, I do this with money with people all the time. If you're, if you're living, um, uh, say, say middle class or less, okay, 
That is the reality that you're currently experiencing in your life. But we also know at the same time, there's people that are living very, very wealthy. If we apply the law of polarity to that, what it does is it allows us to bring in both sides of that reality at the same time and then look at the overall truth about it. So what is the truth? The truth is that there is an abundance. But because we have the power to choose, we can choose to live on the poverty side of abundance or we could live on the wealthy side of abundance. When we're trained to only see, say, the middle class or less uh, of abundance, then that's all we see. That becomes our reality, but it's not the truth. It is only one portion of the truth. And that's all we see, that's all we perceive. People that are wealthy are not part of us. That's not something that I understand or know how to do. And in many cases in my background, it was made wrong. We don't actually see it as being part of the whole. But, the, but based on the law of polarity, any, there's nothing that has just one side to it. Everything has two sides. And those things are connected. They're not separate. So we look at poverty and wealth as two separate things. They're not. They're one and the same thing, either rightly or wrongly used. And it's like with, with everything in life, our greatest power is our ability to choose. So we get to decide what side of that law we live on all the time. And the law, and the law operates with everything, not just with, not just with money. So however we're programmed is basically telling us what side of that law we're living on for all things, and then that becomes our reality. So when I say, well, that's not the truth, that's just your reality, I'm not discounting the fact that, yes, the person is experiencing that for sure, it is part of their, it is their reality, that not part of it, it is their reality, but it's not the entire truth of the experience. It's only, it's only part of that truth. If we're going to bring in the whole truth, we have to understand everything about it first and then use our power to choose to determine where in that truth we want to live and experience our life. That so, is so powerful. Yeah, sorry, go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, it'll change. Stephanie, it changes everything, right? Yeah. Because if there's basically, there's seven basic laws of the universe, and then there's subsidiary laws of all those laws. Really what those laws, all they tell you how to do is how to think correctly. That's it. It, it doesn't change, like you can operate any belief system you want within those laws. It doesn't change it. It doesn't change a person's religious beliefs. It doesn't, it doesn't change their, their beliefs about anything except that it allows us to see everything in the totality of its whole creation instead of just the partial viewpoint that we bring to the world when we're raised in a way where people are relatively close-minded and not even for bad reasons, but just for the reason of this is how you're safe in the world. You see things this way. Mm -hmm. And there's that epigenetic transfer as well, right? So if grandma and you know your parents sort of were used to a certain income, that's what you know, like, and trust and understand. So you're going to probably very likely replicate that in your own life because your subconscious yeah. likes pattern recognition. It's like it recognizes the pattern as comfortable and safe. And it's easier for you to replicate that in your own life rather than to go for or to, you know, if, if you're, if you even have the, you know, conscious awareness that you may want to be making more, in, you know, having a more, more impact with more money. The, you know, the, the Hopi Indians believed that that epigenetic um, idea goes back at least seven generations. And when you make a change, you reverse seven generations behind you and seven generations in front of you. Mm -hmm. when you make a, a change in belief. So yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's carried from one generation to the next. And I like that law of polarity. It actually reminds me of my, my he's just turned seven, uh, my son, Sebastian. Uh, he just asks why. So uh, if I say, you know, don't, uh, I don't know, don't throw your food. Why? You know, he needs to understand why. And he will ask why, 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 why? Uh, we just had um, Dr. David Sinclair on the podcast and he, we were talking about genetics and why we age and epigenetic transfer of trauma. And he actually said something very similar to you, which was, if you can ask the question why and kind of go five or six layers deep, and if the only reason that you can say is, well, this is just how we've always done it, that's not a sufficient, that's not a sufficient answer. You need to be able to give a, you know, a qualitative and quantitative answer as to why it's done this way. And that 
reminds me of this law of polarity that you're talking about because this is, you know, when it, it allows you to look at the whole picture and not just blindly following, well, this is just how this is just how we we've done it forever. So this is what we're going to continue doing. It 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 stimulates a um it it forces you to question your belief structure, which as we've discussed is is sort of buried in the subconscious. And it allows you to open up the possibility of there being more. Yeah, it does. And I was raised uh, in an environment where that's basically what the answer to everything was, Mm -hmm. because that's the way we've always done it, because that's the way that it is, because you don't do those things. There was no real explanation behind much of anything as to why we were doing things. And I was a real curious child, probably a lot like your son. And I wanted to know, I had a lot of whys, a lot Mm -hmm. of whys. And Eventually got to the point where their response to that became, you talk too much. Right. Which is a, which is a form of self-expression, right? You're, you know, even if you throw food on the floor or you fight with your brother or whatever, this is a form of expression. It is. So you can say this is wrong, but you have to quantify it. You have to say it's wrong because not just it's wrong because we've decided we've wrong. It's, it's sex is wrong because the Catholic church has decided that it's wrong. You know, you have to be able to explain it in a way that, um, that makes sense. And I, this is why I, you know, I think my, my children in many ways ask me to, you know, they ask me to question my own beliefs and my own paradigm in, in which I operate because they're asking me why all the time. Yeah. So it, it's incredibly powerful. Well, you know, another thing that's interesting, you brought up the expression very often, and I'll do this in, in seminars all the time. I'll say, and I'll use anger as, as like a, a number one question on this. I'll say, by a show of hands, how many of you were freely allowed to express anger when you were a child or was it denied to you? And when I ask them if it was denied to them, they almost, almost everybody raises their hand. Mm-hmm. So the way that we get to know our true self is through expression. If we cannot express the way that we feel naturally, we never get in touch with that, nor do we ever are we able to bring it into a healthy balance? We're only generally allowed to express ourselves in ways that makes our parents comfortable. Otherwise right. we get shamed or guilted. Right. So that's, that is the other reason why we don't really know who we are because there's so many sides of us that have never been expressed. We've never gotten intimately in touch with that side of our being that has desires and wants and needs and is creative and has the ability to do Um, you know, lots of different things. It gets, it's what Jung referred to when he talked about the shadow side of our personality, that you take things that are relatively healthy or have a good healthy potential. And when you twist them and then shove them back down because they're, they're repressed or they're suppressed. The only thing that we know how to do as a human being is express. But if you cut let's say you had 10 channels of expression. If you cut it down to two, you're taking something that's supposed to be expressed another way at another time for another reason and trying to force it through something that it doesn't belong. And then that's where you end up with extreme dysfunction in human behavior because the, the body cannot consistently suppress that energy. In, in, but if it's, but if, it's, if it's twisted or perverted or if it is repressed, it comes out as disease, it comes out as anger, it comes out as hate, it comes out as sexual dysfunction, it comes out as poverty, you know, it, it comes out in so many different ways that aren't healthy, but, uh, and then we go in and, and we go to take an, ang- an anger management course, like if, if we have an anger problem or something, but, but that's not the problem. The problem is, is that we don't actually understand how to express what we really feel. And anger, I have to say, uh, I'm a big fan of anger. <laughs> like, I think it's a powerful yeah. focuser. It ha- when I am, you know, when I'm working out, for example, this is when I actually find my anger comes up because I, you know, there, it's physically uncomfortable, and you know, I'm lifting heavy weights, and I get angry when I'm lifting. Um, but it's a it's a powerful uh, focuser for me. Now, of course, you don't want to stay angry. But I think, you know, if that's the only motivator that you have that can, you know, maybe that's a different conversation around toxicity. But I think that anger is a really powerful way for you to focus. And I agree with you. I think that it is very much something that we want to all brush under the carpet. We don't want to talk about anger. And um, 
yeah, I, I mean, I, if I were to rate myself in terms of anger, it's, it's, it's up there. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of untapped anger that, that, ha- that I can, that I can kind of get into when, uh, when I'm, at least when I'm working out, I found that that's uh, really useful for me. I, I absolutely agree with you. And if you, if you look at the idea of why people would look down on anger in any way, it's when you've taken something and you've used it for an incorrect purpose. If you use it to be abusive or if you use it to be racist, mm-hmm. or if you use it to, to suppress other individual, like those are all ways where you take something that's a natural, healthy emotion inside of a human being that could save their life. Like there was at the one point when I was fighting for my life, I got damn angry that I was in that situation. You know, it definitely provides energy and, and, and focus, mm-hmm. but it, it's like anything else. If you use it for the wrong reason, then it becomes toxic. So there's a big difference between anger and being and toxic anger or be, or using it in a toxic way. Yeah, and people talk and I think that there's a lot of shame and guilt around uh, being angry as well and you had, you had mentioned that. So when we when we think about shame and guilt, whether it's about the anger that we feel or you know something that's been installed from uh, from you know, mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers, I like to call them the big four. Yeah. Um, you know, how do we, how does that, how does that change the way that we view ourselves or how it affects our potential? Well, this is a, this is a really interesting thing that a lot of people are, are currently exploring right now. Like there's this big debate between uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. Um, Jordan kind of believes that the archetypal stories that come out of religion itself gives us the basis of our value systems uh, that we treasure so much in society. And Sam kind of believes that it doesn't, that it has, that it comes from someplace else, that it doesn't come from religion, but he doesn't have any, he, he can't actually prove where it does come from. So I don't know that anybody knows, but here's what we do know outside of the epigenetic transfer of this, Shame and guilt do not show up uh, as natural and a natural expression within, it, like we're not born with it. It's taught to us. Mm. And you can just, you can, you can see it in natural behaviors of a child. A child is not ashamed of their body. They're not ashamed of their feces. They're not ashamed of their urine. They're not ashamed of throwing up. They're not ashamed of touching it or playing with it or exploring it or any of those things. It's all taught and learned behavior. So the question then becomes, if, if it's taught, how much of it is actually useful uh, in self-regulating our own behavior as we grow up versus it going to a place where it actually suppresses our natural expression? Um, so in a, in a lot of the work that I do, we get rid of the toxic shame and the guilt. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm still up in the air to learning more about if there is some, if there is some natural way of determining how to evaluate uh, good and bad in life without actually using those things. Because it does get into a place where you're really splitting hairs if you get deep into this conversation because then it becomes like a survival of the fittest thing. Like it, it's only the, it's only the strong survive. And we've, the human beings have always been looking to transcend that idea beyond the animal kingdom with the idea of values and values came out of a hierarchy. So, but the hierarchy goes back to the idea of the survival of the fittest and what gets to carry on the mm-hmm. next generation. Mm-hmm. We don't do that anymore. We don't say you're not, you're not smart enough or pretty enough or intelligent enough to breed and, and, to, and, to, and to have babies. But nature does that in, if, if you look at nature. It weeds out the weak or the dysfunctional from continuing on um, with life. The question that's being argued is that is there anything about that that we had that that we're perceiving from an incorrect place by the idea of freedom because you can't do it without oppressing people there's just you, there's no way to do it so right. the idea of that's where they they believe that the idea of the archetypal stories that came in through religion allowed us to cross that bridge 
from the animal, the animal kingdom into having a totally different hierarchy of values and ethics that we know now is, is what we generally practice as, as good and bad. Um, but if we're going to balance that in our life and actually make it something that's very productive, we have to look at how we judge things. And again, it goes back to the entire truth around something and not just a viewpoint or experience where we mark something as good or bad. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about thinking patterns. Um, I know Seth Godin has talked a lot about this in terms of the way that schools teach us how to think. And you know, his, his argument is schools today, like the traditional school system, doesn't really teach us how to solve unique problems. They just teach us to fall in line uh, you know, and it's, uh, I think that the, um, uh, it has its, its roots in the industrialization and getting people to sort of fall into this line worker um, yes. mentality where there's, there's a hierarchy of the teacher is the, has the ultimate power and all the children have to, have to fall in line. Jim Quick also, who was on the, on the podcast, he talks about this too, in terms of thinking creatively and thinking um, imaginatively in order to, in order to, uh, or to cultivate imagination uh, in order to solve problems or puzzles as he likes to call them. Um, do you have a, do you have a framework or a method for proactive thinking? Cause what we're talking about, what we've been talking about is this reactionary thinking the shame and the guilt that, it, that have been installed in us, the, the ways that our mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers, they, they install this software, this hardware into our subconscious mind. And a lot of our behavior really falls from this, uh, you know, from this belief system. And it tends to be more reactionary and more asleep. Is mm-hmm. there a framework or a method for developing proactive thinking that, um, that you employ or that you like? Yeah, there, there is. And, and, um, this is the part where I think it gets really fascinating for the potential of, of human beings. I think that the, the way in which we have a directive by through our spiritual DNA, in other words, who are we, why are we here, and what is our purpose, is expressed with and through desire in our life. Desire comes from the Latin root desire, which means of the Father. And what, it's one of the things that we're actually taught not to follow growing up. Uh, it's, it's almost adds in a, an idea of folly in a way. Even some religion says that desire is not a good thing. And I think they use it in the terms of like sex, money, or too, or too much of something. Mm-hmm. But if we look at it in the way that the word was actually uh, structured, if we go to the etymology of the word, it actually means to know from within, right? So the, the whole idea is, what is, the, what is your desire actually telling you to do? What direction is it giving you in your life? So this is where I started with myself. Um, I heard somebody talk about this very briefly, and it really caused me to really start thinking about it and asking the question, what would happen if you actually followed the desire? Because here's the interesting thing. It doesn't matter where a person is. I was a huge uh, student of Thomas Troward's work, and he pointed out, he talked about desire like this. There's all these different roads. It doesn't matter what road you're on. It all leads to the center of town. If we view that as you have all of these desires and what they really lead you is to the truth of your life, you just have to get on one of those roads as it's passing through what we know as our life. If you continue to follow it, it will lead to that place. I have worked with thousands of people over 20 years. I've never seen that be wrong, ever. It always leads a person to what it is that they're supposed to be doing and why they're here. Supposed to be from like, what is my purpose type thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something that fascinates me. It's something that I teach in a a lot of depth. Um, But every person, no matter where you are, you can find a flame of desire for something and you can start to follow that thing. Here's the part about it that's tricky though, Stephanie, is that a lot of times it makes absolutely no logical sense. It'll say, quit this job and go do something else. And you don't have the skill set. you don't know how to do it, you don't have the money. A lot of people wake up to wanting something different in their life after they've already started creating responsibility of say a family or a job. They have other people that are dependent upon them besides just themselves. 
And it's kind of like turning a locomotive around, right? Like you got to slow that thing down first and then figure out a way to turn it around. And mm -hmm. I worked with somebody who taught me a great deal about following that. And he, 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 he taught me a lesson that I had to sit. I literally studied this for a year before I actually decided to follow it because it sounded, it sounded absolutely asinine to me when I heard it. He said, David, you'll always get what you need when you need it. He said, not what you want, but what you need. He said, so if you're willing to step into whatever that is, you'll never be without. And I was like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. That's my question. I'm like, are you sure? Yeah, are you sure? <laughs> he said, you go home and you trace your life back and you tell me one time you didn't get something you need when you needed it. Mm -hmm. He said, like I, he said, it's different from want. He said, it'll always be the thing. What I found out, first I went home and studied me. Then I started studying people that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I realized we wouldn't even be here if that wasn't true. Like the universe always provides the thing to move you to the next level. It might not be the most ideal thing that you want in the mm -hmm. moment, but it's mm -hmm. always the thing that you need to get to the next place. And then we say, oh, I got lucky. If I didn't get that check from grandma for my birthday, I don't know how we would pay bills this week or whatever. You know, it's always something that seems to come in by luck or good fortune or something that moves us, that gets us out of a situation. Somebody gives us a helping hand, whatever it might be. A guy on an island with a walkie-talkie. A guy on an island yeah. with a walkie-talkie, exactly. Yeah. And I've yeah. just heard thousands of stories that back this up. So after I had sufficient evidence that what he was telling me held some merit, I was like, okay, I'm going to test this. I did not know I was going to do this as a career, but I was waking up every morning at 2.20 every morning for 12 months and it, and it, with a voice in my head that said if you want to live your dream you have to leave which is what prompted this conversation that i had with my mentor to begin with i went six months trying to figure it out on my own and then i went to him and and that's what he said <clears throat> he said first thing he looked me right in the eye and he said just quit i said bob i can't quit i've got a family i've got four children, I'm married, I've got a house, I've got a dog, a cat, a mortgage, I've got the, you know, car payments, the, I, I can't just quit. I don't even know what I would do. He said, you don't need to know anything until you quit. He said, the universe will not give you the next step till you make a decision to separate from this one. He said, choice is your greatest power. It closes this door, but it opens up the next one. And then he said, you'll always get what you need when you need it. So then I went back and I thought about that for a while, but then I was like, okay, I'm not going to tell anybody that I'm quitting. We'll see what shows up. And I thought worst case scenario, I go back to work. Um, if it, if it doesn't work. So the only people that knew that I was doing this was me and my wife and my next door neighbor knew. So here's the, this is what happened for real. I quit my job and I'm waiting to see what shows up. Okay, universe, show me mm -hmm. that you're going to show me the way. Mm -hmm. Halfway through the month, um, I started to get a little nervous because there was nothing showing up that said, here's, here's, the, next, here's the next step. And my ex-wife gets a phone call from my neighbor at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And she says, um, I really need to talk to you and David. Can I come over to the house? And she's like, yeah. Sure, you can come over. I and mean, we know this woman like five years, six years, something. Our kids play together, right? Mm -hmm. She comes over and she said, Phil, her husband's name was Phil. She said, Phil would kill me if he, he told me not to do this. He said that they're going to think you're crazy. She said, but I have these premonitions with people sometimes. I woke up at 2.20 in the morning <laughs> and God told me to tell David to stay the course, it's coming. She says, I have no idea what that means or why I even got that message. And I just started crying. I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I'm just crying, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy shit, right? So I knew that this wasn't made up or anything. And then two weeks after that, I got the opportunity to step into what I was now doing as the, the company that I have. Uh, that was in October of 1999. And I never looked back from that. And I've done the same thing with, I can't tell you how many people and it's never been off. I've never seen it not work, but this you have to be willing to make a decision and say, that's it. I'm done.
Yeah. And, you know, I, I know the word uh, decide when we think about, you know, etymology decide is like to burn all the other options, right? Yes. So de and si de um, is to make like the side is the Latin word uh, for almost murder, right? Homicide, suicide, right. Right. suicide, um, so that there's no other options. It's like the burn the boats option. And this is a good time to sort of parse this discussion, desire with tolerance, because I think that, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, who uh, you saw at the Archangel Summit, I have, she was on the podcast as well. She talks about how she specifically talks about women and how females are, con you know, conditioned to be raised, you know, tolerant. But if you think about the word tolerant, it's, you know, I can put up with this. It displeases me, but not enough to do anything about it. Right. So when we think about following our desire, uh, if we, you know, we want to make sure that we're also becoming aware of the things that we are tolerating. Is there a way or do you, do you have a way of thinking about how we can better understand our tolerance levels or how to um, increase, our, uh, increase our tolerance levels so that, the, uh, that we are not willing to tolerate things that are not, you know, Giovanni talks about this in terms of like an F yes or, you know, like a, yep. either a fuck yes or it's a no. Yeah, so I halfway agree with, I understand what Elizabeth is saying about that. And, and there's a part about it that I would add to it. And that is when somebody's tolerating, because I've seen people tolerate things horrifically all the way till they die. Mm -hmm. And, it, and the, the motivation to change it never seems to show up for them. So I started thinking about that with the idea of what's really going on there. And what I have found out is that when a person is tolerating something, their evaluation of the thing that they're tolerating is off. Something that they believe about what they're tolerating is not true. So the natural state of, the, of, of information in the universe is order. And our brains are designed to take chaos and turn, them, turn chaos into order. When we are evaluating something and we're in a state of confusion, part of what we're evaluating is not true. So when we understand what part of the thing that we're evaluating is not true and we bring the truth to it and we now see the entire truth, it becomes very easy to move out of the toleration. And then, yes, we do have to understand what is the behavioral change that we need to make, mm -hmm. but it will allow us to break the back of that, of that toleration that we no longer uh, allow it in our life. We actually do that, a big exercise around uh, that specific thing about toleration. What is it you're tolerating? Because if you don't remove those tolerations from your life, it is very difficult for you to follow that road of desire to right. what it is that you want. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you could, um, so if you, if you could, you know, if there was a recipe and I said, you know, what are the ingredients for a successful mind? We've talked about desire being one of them. Do you have, is there sort of a, a conglomeration of things that, uh, that make up a successful mind in your opinion? Yeah, definitely. So it, it is to, um, it's a lot of is about awareness. Um, yeah. I think that both genetically and spiritually, we're born to be a success. And success is also about awareness. Like, we all have the ability to swim, right? When we're born, we have the, like if a mother has, gives birth underwater, the baby will come to the surface of the water, take a breath and go back under and hold its breath. We know that instinctively. Yet when we're say four or five years old, they teach us how to swim. And really what's going on is we become aware of how to float and move ourselves through the water. What's interesting about that is we never forget it. If you take that kid out of the water for 20 years, you don't forget how to do that. You push the person back in the water 20 years later and they swim. Mm -hmm. Just like riding a bike. You don't really forget how to ride a bike. So those are aware. That's different than like algebra, right? Like if you learn algebra, but you don't use it again until your kids learn algebra, you probably mm -hmm. don't remember the formulas for, for algebra. Right. Um, so those things are human awareness. And... I think that success, and I do believe that earning money is also an awareness that is inherent in us. And that is really because of the hierarchy of need of money is number three in our life in most countries. So you have air, water, and then food and shelter. But for most people, we don't, we don't hunt our own food and build our own shelter anymore. So right. it's mm -hmm. money. 
it would seem to me that nature or God would know that and it would actually be an awareness. It would not be a, an actual learned skill set. Um, I've never seen anybody go backwards once they become fully aware of all of the issues around money. So I think awareness is, is a big one. And I think that then really learning how to think where if we take the, if we take the universal laws, they explain so much about life in a way where we're incorporating all of the truth that as long as we apply that, that as long as we apply the law to the specific thing that we're experiencing, it allows us to see a truth that we would not have the ability to see without it because we were, we were programmed. And to also understand that it's, it's, it's not a destination. Um, we're always becoming more aware of our potential and what it is that we're here for. So it, it would be following your desires. It would be understanding that most of what it is that we know is only a partial truth. And then how do we actually, thinking according to the laws so that we can actually get to uh, the truth in our lives and, and, and the desire and the purpose of the way that we want to live. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you can't read the label of the jar that you're in. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very if people cool. if people want to find you know more about you, I know you you run the um, you run events and you have a, a podcast. Where can people find you on the internet or uh, in real life? Uh, they could go to davidnagel.com. That's our website. And find out all about me there. And I run the Successful Mind podcast, which is on all podcast platforms. Which is great. And then you also have events as well. Yes, we do. We just did uh, the Art of Success Summit. We do that twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we just did one. We'll do another one in, in six months. And then we have uh, smaller events that we do uh, probably, th we do three, three of them in the spring and three of them in the fall. It's called Eight Steps to Personal Freedom. And that is where somebody can come and learn some skill set and some mindset and see if we're right for you. I, I think that this conversation has been so useful because so many of us, I think that they're, you know, to, to use some of the words and the terminology that we've talked about today, the desire for a better life and to become, to become attuned to what we can achieve and who we really are is a lifelong endeavor, but you give some really powerful tools uh, and really powerful frameworks in terms of how to think differently and how to think in a way that is aligned with who we already are, but we're just, we're just discovering as we, as we go through this crazy journey called life. So thank you so much for your time today. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Thanks for having me. It was a real honor.